I now get the pleasure of introducing our last plenary speaker for the conference. Uh, David Pingeli graduated from University of California at Santa Cruz and then earned his PhD from uh, University of Washington. He's been at New Mexico State since 1982 and is currently a professor emeritus. He has won the award for college, uh, college or university teaching in mathematics for the Southwestern section of the MAA twice and won the HIMO award, which is the national teaching award from the MAA. In 2010, he received the New Mexico Professor of the Year Award. He's been active in teaching reform at the undergraduate level, including the teaches, teaching of calculus and teaching of mathematics history. Um, what his students say, because I did this the other day and it was fun, um, from Rate My Professor, I absolutely loves him. <laughs> Not my typo. He does a lot of interaction with students in class, and he is making math more fun than ever. It's always good to hear. Excellent teacher, one of my favorite in the math department. He gives you homework every day you attend class, do the next class, but you learn a lot in his class and he's extremely helpful towards students. He really knows how to teach math. The homework load is ridiculous. He knows what he's talking about and is excited about teaching it. Even though the material is hard, he makes it seem easier. I've had him for two classes so far and still like him. <laughs> I recommend him highly, but be prepared for homework. So here to speak to us about how to beat the lecture textbook trap and then throw them both away um, is David Pengeli. Um, thank you so much first to the, the organizers and the ge very generous supporters and sponsors of this conference. Amazingly, this is actually my first time attending this conference, um, but it's been very exciting for me. I've, I've already learned a lot from many of you here, and in fact, I, I was telling some of the organizers that about every six or 12 hours while I've been here, I've gone back and revised my presentation because I hear things from you that make me think, oh, I'd better, I'd better connect this to that. And so I've, I've done that several times and I feel a little daunted giving um, a, a large presentation near the end of the conference like this about whether I have anything to say to you that you haven't already heard from other people. But I, I hope I do. And uh, I was warned by the organizers that I might be preaching to the converted and I can see that that's true. Um, and they said, well, make it very personal. Talk about your own evolution and, and give an example. Um, and so I, I look at my own evolution in teaching and I think of it as having been very clearly progressing for about 25 years. And I'd like to sort of have that perspective. Um, it's happened for me in all my courses at all levels, ranging from um, mathematics appreciation for liberal arts students and calculus and all the way up through PhD graduate level courses. Um, and I'd like to share my perspectives a bit um, and, but I'm gonna sort of avoid various buzzwords that have become popular today that are things that I do, but that I sort of came to independently and separately from the buzzwords maybe even before the buzzwords existed. And so what I do wanna to try to do though in, in an hour or less is to, um, is to share with you, um, I'm so greedy, I, I wanna share all my secrets all at once. So um, I'm going to talk about quite a bit, I'm trying not to leave anything out that I would love to share with you. Um, just a little bit about some of my bigger influences. I, I began really, I, I can trace the beginnings of big change for me to the NSF support of the calculus reform movement back in 1987 when I and others uh, collaboratively um, began to develop with NSF support a lot of projects for teaching in calculus and publishing a book of projects. But at the same time, independently, I began to teach with primary historical sources in a very serious way in our mathematics classes. And I don't mean teaching history of mathematics. I want to be very clear about this. I have never taught a history of mathematics course in my life. My institution doesn't even have a history of mathematics course. I'm teaching our mathematics courses, but I'm teaching them using primary historical sources. So I'll try not to say that multiple times, but just to clarify that, it's the mathematics courses in which I'm using the historical materials. Um, and now in recent years, again, with more NSF support, this is all combined and I'm I've been developing a lot of projects based on primary historical sources for a lot of courses. We have 36 projects that are online and are being published, and we can now teach a number of entire regular courses in the curriculum this way. And I'll be sharing some of this with you as we go along. Um, and I'll mention a couple of uh, very personal influences as well. So in a, I, I sort of want to break what I share into three parts. In the first part, I want to talk about lecture, and in particular, the logistics of what might happen in and out of class. All this is very clearly described on my website. I have a lot of material on the web if you'd like to take a look. The second part, I wanna talk about textbooks and what we might do with them, like throw them away, um, and IB, what we might call IBL alternatives to, to standard textbooks. And the third part, I want to give you a case study of a course I've taught, which you may find too extreme to even want to think about, um, but it, 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 it was the combination of all my dreams about teaching, and I'd like to share it with you. 
I am sort of going to violate my own precept here by doing some lecturing to you, but that's because I didn't give you any homework in advance, for which you might be grateful. I'm not sure. Um, but I hope there'll be some time for questions, and I have planned a few little uh, activity moments for you um, during the next hour, so be prepared for some activities, and there might even be a quiz. Um, this is the part that you've probably all, re all heard many times. Um, so lecturing's been pretty standard for a few hundred years or so, right? Um, and I see there being a big difference between inspiration and learning for students. Um, and my feeling is that some lecturing can provide inspiration, but I've come to lose confidence in the ability of lecture to help my students learn very much. Um, television can, a good educational television program can even perhaps be inspirational, but I must admit that if you ask me, I say, oh, I saw a great educational program on television a week ago, and then you ask me, well, what did you learn from it? Uh, maybe I just have a bad memory, but I have a hard time telling you that I learned a, very, a lot from something that was essentially a lecture or a nice television program, and I would have to admit that I probably would have learned a lot more if I'd spent that hour reading a book. Now, I might not have been as inspired, but in terms of learning, I think things like television and lectures and even other forms of video um, aren't terribly good for providing learning, but can provide, can provide inspiration. Uh, this to me is um, epitomized very well by a quote I've heard many times from students over the years along the lines of, you know, Dr. Pengali, I understand it perfectly when you lecture about it. I really understand the mathematics well, but then I can't solve problems at home. Well, I know secretly that that means that all this, the, the student thinks they know the mathematics well from me lecturing. They really don't know the mathematics well from me lecturing because they can't solve problems at home. And so I figure I need to do something different. And uh, as we now know and have been hearing about some at this conference, there are a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence, a lot of good studies now that tell us that we should all be considering other ways of teaching than lecturing. Um, indeed, learning is not a spectator sport. Um, and what do I want my students to be doing? So here are some of my goals of what I'd like to be seeing happening in, the, in my classroom. I'd like my students to be very active, both in and out of class. I'd like them to be doing mathematics, whatever I might mean by that. I'd like them to be exploring and finding their own multiple ways to solve problems, to be creative, to be having fun. I think having fun is tremendously important when doing mathematics, and I tell my students that on day one. Um, and what do I mean maybe by doing mathematics? Here are some of the activities that I would like to see my students doing, namely mathematical experiments, making conjectures, proving things, generalizing. Now, classroom time is very, very precious. I tell my students it's the most precious time in the whole course is the time they spend with me in the classroom and with each other in the classroom. So now we're entering to the issue of logistics and what do I want to happen in the classroom. I'd just like to say very briefly that I was very largely influenced at one moment in time about 20 years ago by Virginia Warfield at the University of Washington who told me about um, the work of Barbara Wolvord um, who raised the question of um, first contact with new material and when and how it should happen. And so the question that I've come to ask myself and, and others is, do you want your students to spend precious classroom time on first contact with new material? Because that's what lecture is, is their very first contact with something new? Or would you rather that that time be spent on some form of higher level activity, in which case first contact with new material, when often Barbara Wolvoord describes first contact with new material as just slogging away. You slog difficult in a difficult way to understand, get first grasp, first sense of brand new material. It's slow. And, um, my idea is to have students do that outside class so that um, something can happen at a higher level in class. And so this means we're going to start to talk about good alternatives to lecture. Now, what, what does it mean if I'm going to stop lecturing? It means that I'm relinquishing total control. Now, this is because lecture is total control. If I prepare a lecture and I deliver the lecture, and if nobody interrupts me, whether I invite them to or not, it's a totally controlled and known phenomenon from the very beginning to the end. Now, if I stop lecturing, I relinquish total control, but I hopefully don't totally relinquish control. Because after all, I do have responsibility as the professor for what happens in the classroom. That's my job. So I still retain responsibility for guiding my students, even though I'm relinquishing total control. And to people who are used to lecturing, this might be scary. In fact, I think one of the reasons why it's hard for people to think of changing away from lecturing is that it is, it is scary. It's, it's unsettling because there are going to be a lot of unknowns that will happen on the spur of the moment when students are active in the classroom. And if you don't 
feel confident at handling whatever might happen, then um, it's quite unsettling. Now, on the other hand, if I find good alternatives, um, I can obviate lecture and uh, look, provide some kind of higher alternative in the classroom. And I want to bring in this idea that this may be, in the end, more rewarding and enjoyable, enjoyable for the teacher, and not just better for student learning. I've come to believe that, and there are some studies beginning to, to come that, may, that support this, that uh, instructors may change how they teach, not just based on some statistical evidence that something will be better for their students, but rather whether it's going to feel more rewarding to them. And so I would like to feel that a change will feel good for me, not just be good for my students. So uh, now I just moved to another slide, but the only thing that changed was what was right at the top, which is that I'd like to see my students preparing in advance, somehow, for class. And if they prepare in advance, then I can do all these same things that you just saw a moment ago. I can relinquish total control, I can retain responsibility, I can obviate lecture, provide a higher level alternative because they've prepared in advance. And so let's talk a bit more about that, at least how I came to think of this. Um, in a, what do I mean by prepare in advance? So I'm actually putting three things here. I'd like to see my students read, write, and prepare work in advance of class. Now let me spell out what I've come to mean by that. Oh dear, there's a but. Oh dear, what, what could the but be? What could the but be about me asking my students to go read, write, and prepare work in advance of class? The but is, they might not do it. <laughs> so um, we need to talk about this. Um, maybe many people, maybe not you, maybe not you in this room, but maybe many instructors might think that their students don't or won't read in advance. They may have experience telling their students, now, for next time, read section 2.2 of the text because I'll be talking about it, right? But how many students really do go and do that reading and engage it in a very serious way? I know that for me, I look back on the times when I did that, and I never had much confidence at all that my students really, really seriously engaged what I asked them to read in advance. So if my students don't or won't read in advance, guess how I'm going to respond to that? Uh-oh. I think I'm going to lecture, even if I maybe was hoping not to. Because if my students didn't read in advance, didn't have any first contact with new material prior to class, didn't think about it, what alternative do I have? I want new material to be discussed in class. They haven't had any contact with it at all. What alternative do I have other than to lecture about it? Well, there's more to this slide than just that top orange arrow because the students are smart too, you see? If they know that I'm going to lecture, this is a little game, right? Okay, I'm maybe going to have to lecture if I think they didn't prepare in advance, but you see, if they know what I'm going to do, namely lecture, then why should they read in advance? If they know I'm going to lecture, wouldn't they be smarter and maybe more efficient use of their time to think, you know, I'll just wait to listen to his lecture first, and then I'll go do that reading he told me to do. But we know that that's not maybe going to happen, nor will it be very effective, and often we say students will instead jump to try to do the homework, and they'll think, oh, I'll go read the book if I really need to, you know? And so there's, this is, well, this is what I call it the trap, okay? And I will have to tell you that the hardest thing that I ever did in changing my teaching, and the thing that took me the longest time to do, and it took me years to figure out how to make this work just for myself, was to get out of this trap. I felt stuck in this trap for a long time, and I, um, I, I really struggled with it. So I want to take, we're going to take the first two minute, uh, not a break, no, I didn't say the word break. We're going to take the first two minute work session. What I'd like you to do with the people at your table is spend just a minute or two discussing whether you agree with me that there's a trap here and how you see this trap if you do and what you think you might do if I said, well, if there's a trap here, how would you remedy it? What would you do about it? So please just take maybe two minutes, have a little discussion about this, and then we'll move on. So I'm very sorry to cut you off after just two minutes. I'm delighted to see how talkative you are, but I'm going to move on, all right? So I'm going to move on, and, and, but I'm going to address precisely um, my view on how to beat this trap. So how and where to cut this, this, this circle, this knot? 
I decided, um, and, and as I said, I don't think cutting this knot is complicated, but it's extremely hard to do because you're breaking very old habits on your part and everyone else's part. It took me years. So how to cut the knot? I myself decided that how I had to cut this knot was I must get my students to read, question, and work with meaningful, engaging mathematics in advance of class. And that this requires them writing about it. I'm talking about the reading now. Okay, yes, the mathematical work they'll write, but I also need them to write about the reading because I don't think that if you just tell me to read something that I'm going to get nearly as much out of it or think nearly as much about it as if I write down something about it. So I want my students to write about the reading. Now, if that happens, if I get them to write about the reading and I get them to prepare meaningful, engaging mathematics in advance of class, then I won't need to lecture in any substantial way at all. And something much better can happen, namely some kind of higher level activity in the classroom. Now, in a little more detail, and I've got this very spelled out in lots of things on the web, including something for students called Guidelines for Homework Assignments, where I tell my students exactly how this is all going to work. From the beginning, and this is a little nuts and bolts here, it's just how I do things. You may do things completely differently, but I want to share with you what has worked for me, and I've come to this after tweaking it over many years. So from the beginning, every daily unit, namely what we're going to do on a given day, has three parts of work to be done at home. Some of it is before and some of it is after. What I call parts A and B, these are rather uninventive names for these things, parts A and B are the preparation I want them to do in advance of the classroom. And part C is post-class, what I want them to do after class, which is a higher final level of achievement with the particular material. Collectively, I want to emphasize to you, I believe these three parts of their daily homework must be very, very highly valued. Now, highly valued means that I'd better make it a large part of their course grade because it's ridiculous to think that we tell our students it's tremendously important you do this and such, and so it's going to count 5% of your grade. Students are smart. They are not going to pay attention to that. Okay? So I make these things, I tell them this is the core of the course. And the core of the course means it's at least 50 to 60% of their grade in the course is this daily work. I tell them this is the grist of the course. So let me tell you just very briefly what my parts A, B, and C are because it took me a while to get to refine it in this way. So part A is about reading and writing. Before any unit of new material is engaged in class, I want my students to read and respond in writing. Now, how do I want them to respond in writing? I, make a, I have found that for lower division courses, I need to make up a few reading questions about the reading. I've got to get, they're not yet mature enough to do this without some reading questions. But for upper division courses, I can ask my students to make up their own questions about the reading. Of course, they're supposed to write all these down and give them to me. So not only do they write their own mathematical questions, if it's upper division, or respond to mine, I will ask them to write about connections they see between this reading material and other things, like last week, for example. Okay? I also ask them to reflect briefly on their work process, to say how much time they spend on this, and then I read these responses in advance of class. So it's very important that I receive this from them in writing before class, usually in my case one or two days before class. I'm still a little low tech here, okay? Although high tech would be fine. I read their responses to this in advance of class and this greatly informs me for going into class. This is what I need in order to prepare for the classroom. I need to know what they wrote about the reading. I use it. I use it to decide exactly what will happen in class at the very beginning of class. Now, what about part B? So part B is the mathematical preparation. I ask them to prepare in advance of class by doing what I call easy to medium warm-up exercises. Some people call this pre-work, okay? Warm-up exercises or other mathematical work. If we're not using a textbook, it's not exercise. It's some preparatory mathematical work. And I ask them to bring this to class. Now. That means that they're coming into class and I'm coming into class and we have this wonderful material that's been prepared in advance. It's, there's their writing about the reading, there's the mathematical work that they've done in advance. They bring it to class. Essentially no lecture will happen. Active in-class work can happen at, a, at this higher level based on their advanced preparation. What we do, what I do first is I discuss with them their responses to the reading. In particular, I'm looking for things where they had difficulty with the reading and we'll discuss that a bit. 
it's very individual how this might work. I might say, well, you know, a certain student wrote this about this. Let's discuss this a bit. Someone else said this. I'll spend maybe, let's say, five or 10 minutes at the beginning of class discussing their response to the reading. But I'm not going to lecture. I'm not going to need to lecture about any of this because I know what they've gotten out of the reading. All that's needed is five or 10 minutes of discussion based on their responses. The rest of class is going to be spent on the warm-up exercises. When I come to class, I arrive on time. Often, half my class is already there. They don't notice me come in the room because they're already talking to one another about the warm-up exercises that they have brought to class. They're already comparing with each other their preparatory mathematical work when I walk in the door. So in class, we work through these warm-up exercises. How does this happen? It can happen in many ways. I definitely have students compare their warm-up exercises with each other in small groups of, say, two or three or four students. Um, we'll have some whole class discussion about them, led, led usually by me. Um, and um, I will often have students put these on the blackboard. I will decide exactly which ones go on the blackboard and who puts it on the blackboard. I'm walking around the classroom during the first part of class. I go around the classroom. I, I've talked to every group. I maybe talk to every student. I see what they've got prepared. And I'll say, you know, Mary, would you put that one on the blackboard, please? And would you put this one on the blackboard? And I won't necessarily have everything put on the blackboard. I'll decide what's most important to spend this class time on with things going on the blackboard. And then what goes on the blackboard gets discussed. Gets discussed in an informal sort of way by me and the students. And I circulate around. I guide this. I guide the whole process. I have to be ready to make decisions on the fly. I have to make a decision every 30 seconds about what's going to happen in the next 30 seconds, unlike lecture. right? But I'm used to this now. As with anything humans take on, once you do something once or twice, you get used to it, and we get very good at it. Um, what about coverage? Your colleagues might say, you know, if you're not lecturing, how are you going to cover the material in the course? God damn it. Right? So, but here's something funny. Okay? Who's supposed to cover the material in the course? The instructor or the student? That is what I see as the, the, the big thing. It's the student who needs to cover the material in the course, not the instructor. Well, my students are covering the material in the course. In fact, they're spending the whole of class time covering it every day. But if I were lecturing, they wouldn't be spending any time covering it. So in fact, I think coverage is very efficient by this, by this method. To me, this completely debunks faculty who say, well, how am I going to cover the material in the course? What they mean is, how am I going to have time to lecture about it? But that's not the point. Now, let's talk about part C. Oh, by, so by the end of class, part, the part B warm-up exercises have been what I call beaten to death. There's no more need to discuss them. Most of them have been on the blackboard. They've been discussed a lot. I certainly don't need to look at their written work. It's all been discussed in class. So you're beginning to probably begin to wonder, how's he going to mark and grade this stuff? We'll get to that in just a moment. But part B, remember, I don't have to grade a thing because it's been beaten to death in class. Part C are the few final, harder exercises that I ask them to do as sort of top quality homework here. Um, there will be only a very, very few that I assign as Part C. They are the more challenging problems. They can start them in class if they are completely finished with the Part B work. Why not start them in class? Finish them at home. And only these Part C exercises need actual careful marking on my part for students. Now, let me move to what I call my findings by what I've, how I've been doing this for a while. Uh, my findings are that my students at all levels can and will read and write, and prepare in advance, and happily work in class, and complete this final homework. I explain the benefits of this to them and exactly how it's going to work on the very first day. And I instill confidence in them. I'm a great con artist, I'm afraid. I instill confidence in them that it's going to work. And it's going to be good for them. They're going to do well in the course. They're going to have a good time. They're going to have a good time while working hard. And I'm going to help them. And they see the benefits of this, and they buy in. And in fact, they buy in so much that if I were ever, and I did this once in my life, to lapse into lecturing, guess what? It makes them mad. Be why? Because I'm stealing their class time from them if I ever, ever make the mistake of doing that. Now, you might think that I might get the following finding. You might think that some student of mine someday might tell me or my department head or my dean that that mean Dr. Pengeli made us do the homework before he ever lectured about it. In fact, he doesn't even lecture about it. And you know what? I have never, ever, in more than two decades of this sort of thing, had a single student say that to me or my department head or my dean. It has never happened. 
So I'm going to make that go away. <laughs> Instead, what I feel is that we accomplish more with the same amount of class time, because they're active working in class, benefiting from that. And an amazing phenomenon that I didn't expect is that the students need less of my time outside class. I actually have fewer time in my office hours. And you might think, that's bad. The students don't come to his office. No, actually, it's good, because I'm in class for them, helping them with them every day, in every class day. They get most of their questions from me answered there in class now, instead of having to come to my office. And I feel there's actually a less rushed syllabus, whatever that may be, than there used to be. We've already talked about coverage. I think it happens well. Let me just very briefly show you one or two example assignments from a um, discrete mathematics sophomore level intro to proofs course, just to give you a sense for this. You might be wondering what they're like. So you see here on the very first day, I'm assigning a reading assignment. We're doing a project. It's a project based on a primary historical source. I tell them, read sections one and two of the project, and here are some reading questions. So this is just an example of the kind of reading questions I give. You can see that number three says, what is an implication? Uh, number five says, according to Aristotle, what's the difference between a sentence and a proposition? Well, if they read the first few pages of the project, they're going to be able to answer these questions. These are very simple reading questions. A bit further down the line, in unit 10, I'm asking them to read section 2.2 of a textbook. And then here are the reading questions, except you'll notice that they're not actually questions. They're things I'm asking them to do based on the reading. But I call them reading questions anyway. And the first one says, make up two great examples of your own, of multiply quantified statements, in which the meaning changes dramatically when the order of the quantifiers is changed, as in these examples of the book, and explain why this is the case for each. This is the thing students can do after reading good examples and discussion in the textbook. Then you can see that the uh, warm-up exercises for that section of the book are coming from a textbook from section 2.2. As warm-up for classroom work, they're going to do exercises 6, 8, 14, 17, 19, and 32. And those are the exercises that we're going to spend a whole class period beating to death. They're all going to get beaten to death all over the blackboard, and we're going to discuss every in and out of those. Now, in the past, I would have assigned those as homework, but now they're being worked in class after my, uh, done in class by students after I've assigned them as pre homework. What are then the final exercises, which is really the only thing I'm going to grade? You see they're exercises 42 and 44. Just two exercises is what I really want to look at closely. And this is the higher level work after the lower level material has been covered in class. So what about grading? Very briefly, as you might imagine, part A and B are not going to take much time for me to grade. The reading questions and their responses and the warm-ups I take a glance at the reading question responses. I often write a little something to the student. I want the student to know I really read their responses, and I really took them seriously, and I did. It informed what I did in class. So I'll write a few little comments here and there, but I don't necessarily write out long answers to their questions. I may say, ask me after class about this, or something like that. Okay? I don't spend enormous amounts of time doing this. And at the top of the page, I put a plus, a check, or a minus. Almost all my students end up with pluses after the first week of the semester. Plus means, good job. You prepared. You did this. Check means, hey, were you really, did you really spend any time on this? And minus means, are you kidding? Okay. And same with part B. Now the, the, oh, sorry. I learned from part A what it is that I need to plan for class. Remember? Now, part B doesn't need any careful grading because it's thoroughly dissected in class. It takes me two seconds to grade each student's part B. I look at the paper and how many sheets there are, and I glance to see if it looks like most of those part B things got some work done in advance of class. And I can pretty much tell if they did it in advance of class or whether they scribbled in class. you know. And I put a plus or a check at the top of the page. And I try to re recording it in my grade book takes longer than putting the plus at the top of the page. And the part C exercises, I do careful reading of my students' work. But remember, it's very few. And I don't use points anymore. Points are ridiculously wasteful of time and everybody's efforts. I use a letter grade. I put it at the top of the page. All the exercises, whatever they are, gets a letter grade. Not, not each exercise, just the whole thing. Gets an A or a B or a C. I may ask my students to redo certain exercises to bring them up to really top quality work. That's all done outside class, though. The Part C exercises are never discussed in class. We've moved on by the time they're working on those Part Cs. So parts A and B are about showing up in class with reading and writing engagement and warm-up preparation done in advance. Part C is the final measure of quality. Remember that parts A, B, and C, to me, have to be a very large part of the grade for the course. It's critical. This is my final slide, I think, about my uh, changing away from lecturing. It's just the logistics which I've been explaining to you. Um, I, my students don't need this, but um, for you, I'm sort of explain, explain it with a nice little chart. So remember, let's look at unit five. I'm going to assign the reading and reading questions on day four, which they're going to give to me on day five so I can read them in advance. On day five, I'll give them the warm-up exercises for unit five. 
And then on day six is when we're going to work on unit five, and I'll give them the final exercise, it's 5C. So you've probably noticed that this means on any given day, like day six, I'm going to be giving them three separate assignments. There's the final exercises for unit five, there's the warm-up exercises for unit six, and there's the advanced reading for unit seven. Does this sound complicated? Well, my students don't think it's complicated, so I don't think you'll find it complicated after you, after you think about it a little bit. My students have this all figured out in the first week. No problem. I do ask them to put the different things on different sheets of paper. That makes it easy for me. Um, now, here, oh, so here's the final slide about lecture. So here's the finale to this part of what I'd like to share with you. This is my motto. If, if I had a one-sentence motto here, it's this. Never, ever lecture on material that students can read instead. Ah, uh, again, things are more rewarding for them and for me. So now, I'd like to do something maybe a little extreme. I want to be particularly hard on the concept of a standard textbook. If you think I'm too hard on textbooks, then just take your favorite textbook that you think I should be hard on and don't consider it a standard textbook, okay? So, <laughs> all right, so let's be hard on standard textbooks. Now here are some things that I think are true about standard textbooks. I'm not gonna, of course, list a standard textbook because I don't want to offend anyone, but here's what I think standard textbooks have as big disadvantages. Now, the author will often tell you in the preface to the textbook that the author has streamlined the material, has organized it very logically to make learning of the material easy. I've come to think these are not necessarily good things. They sound good at first, but I don't think they're so good. For one thing, this often leaves the subject pretty unmotivated because it's been organized not with, the, not with motivation as the primary aim. And it often involves the book presenting answers, if you like, to questions, motivation, and problems that never get asked in the textbook. And the whole thing often consists of a lot of hindsight. Moreover, I think a lot of the challenges in the material are we carefully weeded out by the author who tries to make things easy for the student. And this is not real life. Real life is about challenges. If we're going to prepare our students for real life and for challenges, then we ought to present them with challenges, not something where the challenges are intentionally smoothed out. In fact, a textbook is often a very, very carefully chosen path through maybe, my wife told me not to use the jungle metaphor, but through the jungle that's been cut and paved, paved by the author so that we can drive through on a tour bus and look at things as we go through on the tour bus, but not have to actually hack our own way through anything. And I, I think we owe our students a more challenging experience to help them um, for their future. Textbooks, however, are extremely convenient for everyone. They're convenient for instructors because the first time I get assigned, first time I would get assigned to teach a course that I hadn't taught before, the first thing that pops into my mind is, oh, um, I think I'll go talk to so-and-so who taught that course last year and find out what textbook they used. And I'll go choose a textbook. The first thing I'll do is go choose a textbook. But as soon as I choose a textbook, I've chosen the whole course. I've determined the course. I've let the textbook determine my course. And I think that's, it, it's very convenient but it's a cheap way out in which we aren't making our own course. We're letting someone else make our course. It's also very convenient for students, but I think that uh, there's a great price that comes with that convenience, so I'm trying to get away from that. Um, and so I'd like to start talking a little bit now about what we might call inquiry-based alternatives to textbooks. Now, what would I like an inquiry-based alternative to a textbook to do? Here are some goals. I'd like it to put my students in the driver's seat and uh, give them some real challenges. I'd like there to be big goals, not bite-sized goals like section 2.2 and then section 2.3, which may not be related to very much to section 2.2. Instead of a bunch of little bites, I'd like there to be big goals. Um, big goals could be in the form of projects, for example, which are much more substantial things for students to work on for a week or two and write a big report about, tie a lot of things together, learn a lot of things. I'd like to engender cognitive dissonance instead of easiness. Cognitive dissonance just means that you can get confused about something before you understand it better. We know that's good in mathematics. That's what, that's what people make progress in mathematics. I don't want to take that away from my students. In fact, I'd like to think of my students as explorers. And best of all, I'd like a course almost to be a detective story. Wouldn't that be great? 
And I think I may have mentioned before, I'd like, and again, I don't mean anything technical by this, by guided discovery, I mean I want my students involved in the experimenting, conjecturing, proving, and generalization side of mathematics. Now, I've made up a term here. I wanted to use a different term, but somebody's used it already. Um, so what do I mean by only when needed? You look at a, maybe a typical intermediate algebra or college algebra textbook, and it has a section on the quadratic formula. It says, we're going to learn how to solve quadratic equations. Why are we going to learn how to solve quadratic equations? Often it's because, well, you're going to need to know this next month or next year or next semester, so we'll learn about it now. I just think that's terrible motivation. Instead, I think we should learn about things when we need to know them, when we want to know them. That's how many of us run our days. And I think it's, it's pretty motivational and effective. And we often, in a textbook, isn't done that way. So I'm trying to um, tweak my teaching in ways that provide um, new concepts and ideas, or where students come to new concepts and ideas as they need them for solving something. I think this is very good for motivation. And the whole thing, if I do all this, will also be a lot more rewarding for me, too, as an instructor, and might help get other instructors to want to be involved. Now, I'm going to spend, um, we're, we're getting close to shifting to the third part of what I'd like to share with you. And this has a lot to do with using primary historical sources in teaching. So I'm going to expose you a bit to that from me, which I know is very unusual, um, maybe alien to almost all of you. But I want to tell you about what I've been doing with that and what I think it provides and, and what materials there are. Um, in fact, with some colleagues, with a lot of NSF funding over the past few years, been develop, uh, combining the idea of student projects with primary historical sources. And we actually now have a collection of 36 projects based on primary historical sources that are available on our website and are being published with the MAA um, in, for a variety of courses. And I'm going to tell you a little more about those in a moment. Um, but just say that um, all these things can enable coverage to be a bit more holistic and authentic. Um, mathematically than what you might get from a standard textbook. Um, now, I, I put in this slide last night because I, I'm hearing a lot of people at the conference um, talking about a modified Moore method. And I'd just like to point out how I see primary historical sources as a, a different way um, than um, the modified Moore method, say, and point out just about little for us to think about differences. Um, there's a big tent here, I hope and think, about what IBL is. And I'd like to show some differences. So with primary historical sources, here's what I try to do. I try to choose sequences of sources. And what I'm choosing are pre-existing materials written by the masters. When I say a primary historical source, I mean I want to go to the person who first discovered some important mathematics, whether it was 10 years ago, 100 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. And I want to find that source and hope that it's good for teaching. And don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming that all such sources are. You might think hardly any of them would be. They all seem sound like they'd be awfully hard to read. But maybe you haven't read very many of them. And maybe you haven't thought about that much about how you could use parts of them for teaching. And there are some incredibly useful things for teaching. And that's what I've been working on. And so that's what I mean, is providing my students with a usually English translation of, um, of something written by a master who discovered some important mathematics. Now, if you think about this, these were research materials of the time. These, I'm not talking about taking 500-year-old teaching materials. I'm talking about taking 500-year-old research materials. So this is like reading research papers. This is what graduate students do in graduate seminars, right, is read research papers. Well, I'm asking my undergraduate students to read and study research papers and get their mathematics from research papers. It's just that it's not today's research papers necessarily, but research papers or books from 500 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 or 2,000 years ago, whatever's appropriate. I'm asking my students to read the research from the masters. And what do I then create? Well, I, create a, I try to create a lot. I try to create a lot of context for this, a lot of mathematical, historical, and social context. But I also am going to create lots of mathematical problems. After all, I'm doing this in mathematics course. It's not a history of mathematics course. So I'm creating the mathematical problems and challenges that I want students to do. But they're all coming out of the reading and studying the primary historical source material written by the masters. Now, just by contrast, uh, my impression of uh, Moore method, modified Moore method, is a bit different. One's also creating problems for students and having a whole course built around a very carefully chosen sequence of problems from uh, of problems for the course. So I see here, I'm not going to say much about this. I think there are similarities, but some big differences between these approaches. I'm definitely asking my students to go and read other material written by other people, namely masters of mathematics in the past. That's very different from what happens in the, with the Moore method. I think they're both excellent ways of teaching. I'm not making any criticism here. I think they're wonderful, even though quite different. And I simply wanted to point that out. Now, I'm going to 
spend a few moments giving you a little quick laundry list here of what I think are some of the specific advantages of teaching with primary historical sources. I'm going to go through it rather quickly. I've written about this. You'll find papers on my web page. If you can spell my name in Google, you can easily find all this stuff. A few clicks and you'll find it. Just know how to spell my name. So, um, so this will be a very quick little romp through what, what I, I and others have come to think are some of the benefits of students learning from primary sources. And then I want to share with you um, an example of a course that I've taught. Um, oh, actually, this is a slide that I also put in last night because uh, there was discussion yesterday about in the CUPM um, session about a history of mathematics course and how this seemed to be getting lost. And someone said, well, no, we're, you know, the idea is to put history into historical context into all our courses. So here's what I want to point out is that when I'm teaching with primary historical sources, I'm doing it in regular mathematics courses in the curriculum, things that are in your college catalog that you teach. It's those courses in which I'm, putting, I'm using primary historical sources. So yes, this is a way to integrate history into all the courses, but not just, not just anecdotes or sidebars, but actual mathematical research papers from the past the core mathematics. So for instance, to be specific, uh, we have developed and available online sequences of primary historical source project material with which one could, and we have done, we have taught complete courses in discrete mathematics at the sophomore level, abstract algebra at the junior level, combinatorics, mathematical logic, and number theory entirely from primary historical based projects. In other words, I can now teach any of these courses with our projects. I don't need any textbook at all. So here's, um, here's a, little, um, a little laundry list of things that I think primary historical sources do. And you might, in your mind, try to compare them with other things as I go through here. Primary historical sources are very good at helping hone students' verbal and deductive skills. They provide practice moving from verbal descriptions to precise mathematical formulations. They often promote recognition of the organizing concept behind a procedure. They often promote reflection on present day standards and paradigm of the subject versus the past. They can draw attention to subtleties. Believe me, any primary historical source is going to draw attention to subtleties in a way that you couldn't possibly create by trying to write something. They are so nat You couldn't make these things up even if you wanted to. That's what it comes down to. They're there. You couldn't, you couldn't create them. They're so great at promoting discussion of subtleties in mathematics. They also promote students' ability to equally participate because every student is at an equal disadvantage when reading primary historical source material. They often offer very diverse approaches to material. They encourage quite authentic versus routine student proof efforts through exposure to original problems in the context in which they arose. They certainly promote a very human vision of mathematics, and they often provide a framework for the subject in which the various elements appear in the right place in a sequential, motivated way. Finally. They can promote a dynamical vision of the evolution of mathematics. They can promote enriched understanding of the subject through greater understanding of its roots for both students and instructors. And they can engender what I've called cognitive dissonance. The French have a wonderful single word for this called dépaysement, which means putting yourself outside your country. In other words, putting yourself in unfamiliar territory when comparing a historical source with a modern textbook approach, because resolving this cognitive dissonance requires an understanding of both the underlying concepts and perhaps use of present day notation. Now, I'd like to move to the last thing I'd like to share with you, which is a case study of a course I taught recently. Now, this case study, I, I was worried this would be too extreme for you. But I decided to do it anyway, because it might be my only chance to share this with you. <laughs> this is a pretty extreme example. It embodied all my dreams about teaching over many years. I tried, decided to try to do everything at once. Um, I hope you could envision more modest possibilities from this. If this frightens you, ask if you could take one thing from this and consider it worthwhile for you. Something more modest than what I'm about to show you would be a single project or a sequence um, of sources, of, of materials based on primary historical sources. I'm to the point now where, and I couldn't have been here except for now versus 20 years ago, all my teaching is aimed at figuring out how to teach my courses using primary historical sources. So what's this course? Well, let's call it number theory a la Sophie Germain a course of guided discovery from, or rather to, her research manuscripts on Fermat's last theorem. Now, I'm going to need to explain very briefly to you uh, what this is all about. First of all, the course in the catalog is a first number theory course. It's at the advanced undergraduate level, but it doesn't really assume anything other than the fact that students do know how to prove things in mathematics. So it's not a proofs course. It's for someone who already knows how to prove things, but they're going to learn number theory for the first time. So we're starting number theory from scratch. Oh, 
Good, something fun. So, oh, but this is what the quiz is going to be about. Okay, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds to look at this and see what you can figure out that will help you with the quiz later. So don't say anything, just think about this. Okay, we'll come back to this in a while. Now, when I, when I, um, one thing one could do when starting to design a course like this is ask, what are the typical topics in a first number theory course? It might be good if I thought about covering the particular topics in a first number theory course. So here's what I think, after looking at a few number theory textbooks, might be the typical first topics in a first number theory course. I looked at these and I thought, I'll cover these. So hopefully that's a pretty good first undergraduate number theory course content. Now I need to talk to you about Sophie Germain. Now I could talk to you about Sophie Germain for hours. Okay, I've recently published a 75-page paper in Historia Mathematica about Sophie Germain's manuscripts on Fermat's last theorem. You can look at it if you'd like. It's on my personal web page. I'm not going to try to do that now. But here's what happened. 20 years ago, I was developing a unit on, with primary sources for an undergraduate honors course that I had developed. And the idea was to look at primary sources in the development of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And whether you know this or not, Sophie Germain um, was the first woman in mathematics who did important original research that we know of in mathematics. This was 200 years ago. And we've known for 200 years that she worked on Fermat's last theorem. And she's known for a theorem that was the first general theorem towards a proof for Fermat's last theorem, but she never published it. And we know of it only from a footnote that Legendre wrote in a treatise of his own on Fermat's last theorem in which he credited her with a theorem that he developed over several pages. Well, to make a long story very short, I found that there are several hundred pages of her handwritten manuscripts that still exist. And it's a miracle that they exist. And I've been studying them. And I've written about them. And um, oh, well, let me show you a little bit. Okay. So this is a letter that she wrote to Gauss, part of a letter that she wrote to Gauss on the 12th of May of 1819 from Rue de Brac number 4 in Paris. And in this letter, she tells Gauss all about her work on Fermat's last theorem. Wow. She summarizes it for him. This is after she got past the male impersonation that she had to do for, in order to contact mathematicians to begin with. With Lagrange, Legendre, and Gauss, she initially took on a male pseudonym. I'm not going to go into that here. It's, an, it's a story that is stranger than fiction from today's point of view, but it's the truth. It's pretty amazing. Um, you can read about it. I'm going to focus here on how I use this in a course. Now, this is some more of this letter. And I want you to look down. The second to last line, is, there's an equation. So you notice it's mostly words. <laughs> Um, down the second to last line, do you see that little equation down there? Second to last. There's a congruence there. Do you see the congruence symbol? She was one of the first to adopt the congruence symbol that Gauss introduced in his Disquisitionis. And she says there that R, this is in French, of course, that R, and you might have a little hard time with her handwriting. There are lots of things that are difficult. And it's early 19th century French. I forgot to tell you all those things. So anyway, that congruence is using R, she says, is a primitive root of unity. So now think about it. Suppose I wanted my students to understand even this letter. They need to know what a primitive root of unity is. Well, that usually comes about the middle of a first number theory course, maybe. Okay. So what I realized at some point, let's see, what's next? Oh, well, here's an English version of this. How nice. Okay. There we go. You can see the same congruence down at the bottom. Now, we don't have time to look carefully at this letter, part of it. I'm going to move on. I wanted you to see the congruence symbol. This is the beginning. This is part of the first page of a beautiful, polished, 20-page manuscript that Sophie Germain wrote that probably could have been published but never was. And I'm not sure if anyone has ever read it until recently. I hope Legendre did, but I'm not even sure of that. Now, here's an English version of this. Um, she says, the impossibility of the Fermat equation would follow without doubt if one could demonstrate the following theorem. For every value of p other than 2, there's always an infinity of prime numbers of the form np plus 1 for which one cannot find 2 pth power residues whose difference is unity. What she's saying here is that if she could prove the result at the bottom, it would prove Fermat's last theorem. Wow, she's serious here. Okay? Of course, you look for the modulus, and you don't see the word modulus there, and you don't see the word congruent, but you do see the word residue. So somehow there are congruences going on in this center sentence, but it's not so clear from a modern point of view what the modulus is. Okay? Well, as you may be beginning to imagine, I made the crazy decision that I was going to teach a number theory course entirely using these manuscripts. My goal was I decided at one point that in order to understand her plan for proving Fermat's last theorem and how far she got with it, all you really needed to know mathematically was the content of a first number theory course today. And that I would have my students learn the number theory they needed in that course in order to understand her research manuscripts. In other words, this would be a course in which they would read research manuscripts 
from Sophie Germain from 200 years ago to learn the mathematics that she knew that she was using. And so this is what I did. And um, I think I will skip one slide here, and we'll move to this one. I just want to show you one more part of a page from this manuscript A. This is, the, this, is to, this is just to show you the kind of material my students are reading and working from. There is no text, but we're using this. This is, this is the material for the course, OK? So here's just, here's just a paragraph, one of the paragraphs that they're going to read and try to understand. Let me read it for you. Now, since nothing prevents the successive assignment of an infinity of values to n, one can conclude from what precedes that there must exist an infinity of values of p for which the Fermat equation is impossible. However, such a result is too vague to apply to the demonstration of the impossibility of the same equation in the case of a determined value of p. What she's claiming here, I'm sure you can realize this, she's claiming that somehow she's going to manage to prove Fermat's last theorem for an infinite number of prime exponents, but we won't know which ones. Now, if you think about this, this is sophisticated mathematics. This is highly authenticated, sophisticated mathematics. If my students can grapple with this, I will feel they've done, done and learned wonderful mathematics. Now, you're beginning to wonder, did she actually prove this? OK, I'm not going to discuss that with you right now. We don't have time. You might be wondering, did she prove her Maslow's theorem or parts of it? I don't have time to tell you about that. OK, I, I think I know the answers, but OK. You can ask me later. OK, so now let's spend a moment discussing the pedagogy for the course. OK. Um, it was of this guided discovery nature. I used the only when needed. I had to work really, really hard to restrain myself from telling my students day after day about, after day about Fermat's little theorem, that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p when p is a prime. I just so wanted to tell them about it. And I told myself, no, David, don't tell them, don't tell them, don't tell them. And one day, one day, they got to the, I don't know, the third page of this manuscript, and she went from one sentence to the next. See, this is a research manuscript. To get from one sentence to the next, you have to know some mathematics. She assumes you know the mathematics. Who did she write this for? She wrote this for Legendre and Gauss. She didn't explain the details. It was a research manuscript. She's not going to say, and oh, now I'm using Fermat's little theorem. She just did it. Okay? So my students came to this sentence and said, what's she doing here? And I said, well, what is it she seems maybe to be using? And after half an hour, they decided that maybe it looked like she was using a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p for p of prime. And my students said, is that true? And I thought, this is good. Okay? So then we spent the next week seeing why that was true. OK? So this is my only when needed idea applied there. The idea was for them to learn almost every topic of the standard course by fathoming these primary sources of hers, teaching to these manuscripts. Um, now, I purposely didn't want to have a textbook of any sort in common between the students, because I didn't want the textbook encroaching into the classroom on their part or mine. But I wanted them to have a security blanket. So I told every student to go get themselves a textbook from the library or buy one. I gave them a few possibilities, but I didn't want them to all have the same book. But they could have it like as, you know, by the bedside, you know. You can look at it, OK? Be comfortable. And you can imagine that this was done in a very much seminar style with group work, presentations, advanced preparation, and so on. I pretty much used my ABC method that I've told you about. I tweak it in various ways. And the course really was a detective story. The detective story was to uh, follow Germain's mystery trail of trying to prove Fermat's last theorem and how much did she succeed in doing that. So I think I've already told you all this. I'll just mention that the, for the quadratic reciprocity law part of the course, I had some other sources by Fermat, Euler, Gauss, and Eisenstein that are in a book I published called Mathematical Masterpieces. And I used those rather than the Germain manuscripts for that part of the course. And what kind of assignments did I give? Let me just give you, you're probably wondering, what kind of assignments did he give the students? So here's an example of a reading assignment. Read and write your own questions on the paragraph that begins with, with the words, with the view of. In other words, I told them paragraph by paragraph, let's move through this manuscript. And an example of uh, warm-up preparation for class was, let's jump to the middle of this, just since we're a little short on time. See the word discuss there in the middle? Discuss very clearly how to interpret her claim about a finiteness property and why she concludes, and what she concludes therefrom. Is she right to conclude that she is on track to prove Fermat's last theorem for infinitely many exponents? That's the kind of warm-up work I asked students to do for class. And we spent class time working to decipher and discuss this. And then here was a final homework assignment. And let's just jump down to the very bottom where I say, I, I had quite a number where they're supposed to prove things. But here was an example of something where I didn't ask them to prove something. Instead, I asked them to do experiments. Calculate some experimental data for supporting her claim made above. Evaluate what you find. How well does it support her claim? This required a lot of congruence calculations on their part. They had to learn how to do congruence calculations efficiently. So I'm going to share with you just very briefly some of the student comments at the end of the course. I'm going to let you read them yourself. So I, I just want to make a couple of comments about this. Um, I'm very gratified to see students talk about feeling that the focus for them was on learning rather than grades. Many students really feel their focus in courses is on getting a grade. 
and not learning just and not the, the thrill of, of learning. Um, they like, I mean, the, the response from students, you might be wondering, what did his students think? They probably were, thought this was terrible. This was the highlight of my teaching life because of their response. My students, I, I just can't tell you how good I feel about the students and their response to this course. Um, and this is pretty typical. Um, they obviously like the very high level of student participation, which I think fits with the active classroom. And it's not uncommon for me to have my students write on teaching evaluations that they wish other faculty in my department were teaching in similar ways. I've never known quite what to do about that. Um, and, um, and you see students talking about, this is a student whose first language wasn't English. I've never expected classroom could be this much fun with learning of abstract mathematics. So there's, the students literally say, this, this, you know, there's fun here. So now, remember, I, oh dear, I, promised, I said there was going to be a quiz. Um, OK, so, so help, help, help. What is this? Cheese. It's not cheese. Good try. It's cookies. Thank you. It's cookies. So what happened is the last day of class, this, they were going to present stuff on the quadratic reciprocity law. They said, could we have pizza? I said, sure, you can have pizza. And then they brought cookies, too. They made these cookies. They brought them in. And what's on the cookies? Icing. And what's the icing? It's? It's math. In fact, it's, it's number theory. These are number theory cookies that the students brought. So what's the number theory on the cookies? What do you see? Euclid's lemma. That's right, right in the middle. Euclid's lemma. If a prime divides a product, it divides one of the factors. What else do you see? The quadratic reciprocity law, right? You see the quadratic reciprocity And what's, what's on the bottom right? Fermat's little theorems on the bottom right. Further to the left, we see Sophie. And up in the upper corner, we see Fermat's last theorem, there you go. And hidden behind there is something with the Legendre symbol. OK, you did pretty well with the quiz, but here's another quiz. There are more cookies. OK, you haven't seen these ones yet. So let's see. There are <laughs> so these are cool. There are good primes and bad primes. That has to do with the quadratic reciprocity law. Uh, don't worry about that upper left one. Well, OK, I'll tell you what it is. It's upside down. That's the problem. It's the Bezu equation. For the greatest common divisor of two numbers is a linear combination of the two, but it's upside down. But the really cool thing for you to figure out, the real mystery here, is the lower right two cookies. OK, so here's the context. I want to recommend a book to you. This book is recently published by the MAA. It's called Sophie's Diary. You can remember that, right? It's written by Dora Musilak. It is a wonderful, wonderful book for you and your children and grandchildren. Now, not when they grow up, OK? It is a fictional diary by Sophie Germain from age 13 to 18, just before we know she made contact with Lagrange. It, in the alternate chapters, Dora Musilak has Sophie Germain teaching herself the number theory she will need to know to university level in order to make an impact on Lagrange, which she, we know she did somehow, but we don't know how. And in the other chapters, she is telling what's happening outside her door. Now, what could be happening outside her door? She was 13 years old in 1789, and she lived in the center of Paris. The French Revolution happened outside her door. So in the Sophie's diary book, you, see this, you, you read the French Revolution happening while Sophie is trying to teach herself mathematics. And you got it. That, there, that lower middle cookie is the guillotine, because Louis XVI loses out in the middle of Sophie's diary. And on the right there, I think it's an escargot, but I'm not sure. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>